Right. My little uh, title for, for this evening is um, Delving into the Roots of a Land Ethic. Now, a land ethic, um, I first came across from uh, little quotes from Aldo Leopold. My, my youngest son gave me a, gave me a, um, a, a little uh, framed picture of it a few years ago. And uh, I'd just like to share with you tonight um, a little bit of, of, of what I've learned about what a land ethic is. Okay, so um, firstly, I'd just like to have a look at what land is. Now, um, I meant this evening to bring a bowl of hazelnuts because um, I, <laughs> I forgot all about it. But um, so, some lads and lasses from our local school have been up with us at the husbandry school and, and, and have been, uh, as, as, as part of their, um, you know, being sort of excluded from school and, and coming back into school, uh, they, came, they came around our, our school and um, helped us pick some hazelnuts from the tree. From, from, from the ground, and I was just going to use the hazelnuts as uh, a little sample of what land is. So uh, the, the hazelnuts have got, you know, packed full of information about the whole of history from, where, from the, the, the beginnings of the land. I mean, they've actually grown on, on, on soil, which I think is the same soil all the way around here, which is De Devon's uh, 400 million year old uh, uh, silts. And the... Um, Basically, land is alive. It's a, it's a community. It is us. Okay. Now, this is a little, um, this is, <laughs> this is a little uh, quotation from the Peasants' Revolt. Um, and what I'd like to do tonight is, is, is just delve a little into the nature of what... Um, in, in, into the nature of what land is. The, yeah, just delving a little into the substance of, of, of what nature is, what the earth is, okay? It's, it's, it's all of us. It's our, it's our global and it's our local structures. It's, it's our um, messy world. It's advertising. It's commoditizing. It's TV. It's, it, the, 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 the stuff of the earth is everything around us. It's, a, it's our survival in this unfair world. And our delving, what I'd like to do is, is delve into a little bit of the ancient strands that can... That, um, you know, we can spin together to make something of value out of. Um, our presently, yeah, so who owns, our, yeah, let's dig deep. Who owns the earth? Um, what is it, um, what is the nature of owning parts of the earth? Um, our presently accepted model of ownership is uh, from original holdings, uh, which have all been uh, uh, originally taken by force from our Aboriginal cultures, who we all come from, who are part of the earth, okay? First of all, the earth is a bit too big to talk about all at once, so let's just divide it up, use geography, okay? Divide it up into boundaries and borders, um, which, you know, have been done amazingly well. So, you know, we, we've, got, we've got different boundaries about, you know, building plots, we've got nations, we've got We've got counties, we've got hedges. So we have, to, we have to look at a plot of land and our relationship with it so we are members of the community of land, okay, within boundaries, so we are part of the ecology of land, okay, and then we have to look at our relationship beyond the boundaries to the, the wider ecology and, and, and how... We have to look at a little bit of, of how that, that relationship between uh, our community within the boundaries that we feel members of, but also, of course, you know, it, the way ecology works is, you know, we're all human, we're humans all the way around the world, and every, every bit of land is part of a human ecology. So we have to look at our relationships, our fair relationships out externally. So... What I'm going to do very, very quickly is just look into a little story of one little piece of land uh, not far from here. It's just the other side of Exeter. Um, and these, this, this man uh, uh, there <laughs> is called Walter. Uh, he was my teacher in um, you know, being a member of a land community. His father, Tom, okay, uh, was tenant of uh, some land that was... Uh, in the 
just the other side of Exeter, up until 1954, when he bought it from the, uh, the, the landlords, who were um, the Lord Sidmouth, the Addington family. Okay. Now, this here is um, a little bit of, of uh, document I came across relating to Walter's farm. It's called Fair Oak. Okay. And this, uh, I don't know if you can, can you, oh, wrong button again, hang on. Can, can you read this? It, it, it says here, uh, it, basically it's a court document that um, relates to enclosure of what was common land, and, and it was the document that the court used to justify the landlord taking the land from the common people and, and, and it becoming part of his property. Uh, and the way they did it, I mean, I think the court clerk was thorough in how he did it, but of course he was being paid by the landlord as well, so anyway... Um, what it says here is the, lo the uh, lords of the manor of Upottery since the conquest have been only the Pomeroys, the Cheneys, the Willoughbys, the Blubberts, I think it is, Lord Mountjoy, Popham's, Mr. Laws, and thence to the plaintiff. Now, this was in 1766, and the plaintiff was a, was a guy called Dr. Addington, who was the same family that uh, Walter's father, Tom, bought, to, bought, the, bought the place off um, Okay, uh, next, right here, the clerk goes into the details a little bit of, of how that succession of land title <coughs> works, okay, and here he says, Ralph de la Pomeroy was a Norman and came into England with the conqueror, okay, and then he gives a little bit of a reference to it, which is some, uh, he was chief lord of the fee of a pottery, when Doomsday was made. And then he goes on, the, the title there is because William de Pomeroy succeeded his father, Ralph, and then uh, Henry succeeded his father, William, and then Henry succeeded his father, Henry, and then Henry succeeded his father, Henry, and Henry succeeded his father, Henry, and Henry succeeded his father, Henry, uh, all the way through to the 15th year of Edward I. Okay, that's where we got to. And then he, he lived uh, till the 14th year of Edward II. And then he, yeah, I won't go, I won't go anymore. Anyway, anyway get, get the pattern anyway. Basically, William the Conqueror and his mates came over and they thought, we like this bit of land, and he passed it on. And so this is the basis, this is, this is the legal basis, basically, of, of every title deed, you know, every title deed that, that, that's, the, that's the building plot under our houses. And, of course, the English ty uh, land legal system has gone all the way around the world, and so, you know, with the British Empire. So, so, so we, this is the basis of enclosing you know, colonial land as well. Um, so I think by, by just, uh, just having a look through that title deed, I think we've sort of established that, that, you know, land has originally been taken by force and is held from others by force. Um, I don't know about you, but I feel that I'm at the end of my tether with, 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 with suffering under this system. Um, um, and is anybody else at the end of their tether about suffering under this system? <laughs> um, uh, I'm, you know, I'm just, I'm just an ordinary fellow. I'm just, um, I, um, uh, I got very poor reports at school, average poor, um, you know, could, could, could spend a lot less time looking out the window, you know, it's, it's, it, and, and if I can see if I can see that there's something fundamentally wrong about our relationship with land, then I'm, I'm certain that anybody can. Um, you know, the, this, this fellow, um, Wendell Berry, uh, wrote a fantastic um, essay called uh, Renewing Husbandry. Um, and, you know, I'm doing, you know, a little bit of uh, attempting to follow in his footsteps, but unfortunately I'm really, really bad at husbandry. And... Uh, uh, I know I fail much more often than most people would. Um, but if, I think if even I can see what is wrong with the system, then uh, I think anybody can. So let's just have a quick uh, look at um, what we have to develop to, to get to a system whereby exclusive use of land, which 
you know, we need, if we're going to be a member of a land community, we need to have that sort of um, uh, arms around us, you know, feel safe, like you said, in about you know, your, your um, uh, feeling safe about um, being in your bed without somebody walking, walking into your bedroom. If we, you know, it's the, same, it's the same with the garden, isn't it? You don't want anything, you know, if, you, if you're going to have a, an, an intimate and loving relationship with the land which you are part of, then you know you need to you need to have some safe and reliable. I think what was it you said about um, uh, ab ab about uh, a an agreement with your neighbours to, to to owning land. And I think there is there is a, there is you know there is a solution to this. And it is that if we have exclusive use of the land, then we pay compensation to society. For the, for the full rental value of that piece of land that we use, so that, you know, they feel happy about being excluded from that piece of land. And, and you know, I believe that this is, this is, this is a question that, that, that it becomes, you know, do we use land with force to exclude others, or do we use land with fair and polite com compensation to others, which, which then becomes uh, something that we can feel, you know, we're, we're, we're being hospitable. We can, we can, we can have, our, have our exclusive use of a piece of land at, at the same time as feeling hospitable to the people who we're excluding by treating them fairly, compensating them for, for full, for full um, use of the land. Um, There's, yeah, just basically two, two little bits of land use, um, you know, without kindness, with, with a little kindness. Um, I heard the other day that um, we are living no longer in a post-war world, post-war Europe. We are now living in a pre-war Europe, a pre-war world. Now, I feel that if we are going to, if we're going to um, do something about this, um, we're all at the end of our tethers. I feel that we're at the end of our tether, of, uh, you know, offering uh, the, 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 the difficulties of, of, of functioning under a, under a system which is basically it's stealing from us all the time. The, the, the corporate, it, just, just a, a little bit, uh, making myself clearer, the little bit of um, following through that title sequence of land use from William the Conqueror through all the Henrys. Uh, most of the valuable parts of the world, the title deeds to the most valuable parts of the world, are now, of course, held not necessarily by people, but by, held by people like bodies that we call corporations or financial institutions who hold the title deeds to the earth and its divisions, its geographical divisions. Um, and you, I, th I think we, the people, we need to start saying, hang on a sec, this land is not yours, this land is part of us. And I think perhaps, perhaps a, um, the crux of a land ethic, as I see it, is, is that the land is us. It's not ours, but it is us. Um, and that perhaps, um, you know, perhaps we could uh, get to a stage where... Um, Schools will um, praise school children for looking out the window. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, one of Jonty's uh, big points, I think, and somebody else raised it earlier earlier on, is is that one of the reasons that that um, there is some sort of justification for ownership um, is that we need to be able to put some sort of boundaries around our bed, around our house, around a piece of land on which one's going to con conduct husbandry. Um, and those boundaries always uh, lead to conflict. Um, and I would recommend Jonty's wonderful um, essay, uh, which is available at the, at the back, which we'll talk about more about at the end, called Husbandry and Ancient Art for the Modern World. Um, and uh, in, in that, he, uh, one, of, one of the things that he, that he uh, uh, addresses is, is just the way that this, this contest for territory has been, has been played out. But I think one of the other interesting things is, is, is that uh, over millennia, uh, not only have people contested and fought over land, 
but they've also contested and fought over ideas about property rights and ownership. Um, and uh, you can see uh, through the last, even through the last thousand years, the way that property is viewed, is, is, is land, landed property is viewed in this country, in the law, has changed hugely without people really being very aware of, of the ways in which it's done so. The Greeks, certainly 2,000 years ago, had a, had a very sophisticated debate about what sorts of things could be held as private property, what sort of things should be held as communal property or collective property. And a lot of their ideas were codified by the Romans into Roman law, which became the basis of the, of the law of, uh, of this country. And just so we've got a shared language, um, I've passed out, we've passed out onto the tables. I think there probably might not be quite enough for everybody, so um, try and share them around. Um, some handouts. And on the, uh, the front of, of this, there are a series of boxes. There's a diagram with a series of boxes that just set out the four types of property that are described in, in Roman law. And the way that they're distinguished um, is by, not, not by who benefits from the ownership, um, but from who makes decisions about its use. So um, one form of property is private property, where decisions is made, are made by individuals, or increasingly these days uh, by corporations acting a, as quasi-individuals. Um, collective property is, is property where decisions are made by the state, whether that be national, state, or, or, or local. Common property is property where decisions are made by a defined group of commoners, um, or possibly by a trust acting on, on, on their behalf. Um, and then the fourth sort of property um, is the one that, that the colonialists um, invoked when they uh, colonized other, other countries, declared them to be terra nullius or, or uh, in no ownership, um, areas which we now refer to as, as open access regimes, in which by and large there's, there's pretty much a, um, a, a free-for-all about, about who has the right to use and determine the, the use of, of land. So if your map of property extends to uh, those four boxes, what do you do about the fact that the present distribution of property is really very unsatisfactory? Well, if your, your view and your preferred approach is limited to private property, then what you will do is to do things that change the distribution of property uh, between private individuals. And clearly, um, force and coercion is something that's been, is a way that that has been done over the course of a long time. Um, there are some sort of fairly noble efforts that have taken place within that paradigm, um, like, for example, the land reform uh, movements that have confiscated lands from very large landowners, particularly in South America, and redistributed them to peasant, to peasant farmers. Um, there are other ways of, of, of defying existing owners. Uh, like squatting and occupation, uh, each of which can be ways of either permanently transferring private ownership of land or of disturbing the status quo enough uh, that things jiggle around and, and, and property rights change. If the bit of the map that you see is collective property, then you'll probably um, uh, want to look at solutions that involve transferring uh, property rights to, to the state um, in the hope that they will actually make, make a better use of making sure that we all benefit from, from uh, land, for example, than, 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 uh, than the present, present system. Um, and I think that, that although the state is, is it's reasonable for the state to, to have property rights over some land for its legitimate purposes, um, I, there are many people who'd be very wary about allowing the state to uh, take over collectivised farms and housing and so on, um, even though they have a role for that. But that's another possible route in. And if common property is what you see on your map, um, then the sort of things that appeal to you are commons trust, uh, community land, land, land trusts, and transferring land into those sort of structures um, seems like the answer. So given this sort of map of property, which is the current legal system in this country, the, 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 the options that we have are either to redistribute land within one of these categories or to transfer land between one category and another. The big problem when you start transferring land is how do you acquire the land 
in a, in a country like ours where all of it is claimed by somebody. And um, the only options that seem to be available uh, are gift, uh, purchase, uh, or coercion. Uh, and most attempts to transfer, transfer land have actually proved to be, to be costly, either in terms of cash uh, or in terms of violence. So what I'd like to do is, is to introduce you, to, well, maybe not introduce you, but to, to promote, uh, as we've come from the Henry George Society of Devon, um, something I think is a completely different view of, of uh, property rights to land. And it's one that Jonty started, to, started to, to, uh, to elaborate when he said, said that in order to feel comfortable about um, occupying land, um, he feels that he would like to be, to be in a position to compensate those who he excludes from the borders. And, and this is an idea which, which um, as far as I can see, was first described in 1776 by Thomas Spence, who was a, a Newcastle school teacher. Um, and he delivered a, a, a lecture to the Newcastle Philosophical Society. Um, and um, as a result of publishing this lecture, he was driven out of Newcastle. His school was closed down because it proved a threat to existing uh, land, landowners. But the problem with this is that it doesn't have this uh, approach to, to property rights, doesn't feature on the map there, and it doesn't have a recognised shared name that everybody, everybody uses. Um, and that's a real problem. Um, I think John T. would call it husbandry. Um, I think I've called it for many years stewardship. But both of these are pretty much minority terms that are not widely recognised. So I think we do need some sort of term for a new system that's more focused on use rights to land and less focused on absolute uh, eternal ownership. Um, so I'd like to describe what I think th this stewardship or husbandry is. But first of all, I think we just need to be clear what ownership is. Now, um, when we were talking about ownership of tables and, and things, I was thinking, what is it that I own that I feel that I really have a legitimate claim over. And the thing that comes to mind is a musical instrument that I made 40 years ago, that, and which, which I have been closely involved with ever since in one way or another, and which I feel is really mine, and nobody else has got any claim on it at all. I feel very possessive about it, and I feel that we've given each other a lot over, over, over this length of time. But the law does not recognise a, a relationship between a person and a thing. It's a little bit like the question about who does, who does it uh, uh, recognise? It's a bit like the issue about does it recognise plants and, uh, and animals as having ownership rights? Um, so uh, the law instead recognises relationships with pe between people. And therefore, property rights are not a relationship between me and the thing that I asked you to talk about in your first, first session, you and, and the thing you, you talked about in the first session. But they're bundles of rights and responsibilities um, that are enshrined in law. And if you turn over the, um, the, the handout, on the left-hand side, um, you'll, ha you'll find a description of um, the rights and responsibilities that go along with the sort of ownership that we've been talking about which is known as the liberal conception of, of ownership, there really ought to be lots of different conceptions of, of, of ownership. And uh, I don't want you to sort of work hard on this, but if you scan down it, you'll see that the right to determine its use is really uh, critical to uh, the idea of ownership, and the right to transfer it to whoever you want to. And sort of by implication, the right to do anything you, you, you want to do with it. There are, this is of course is a simplification, uh, it's a standard description, but it is an oversimplification. Owners have to operate within the, uh, within the, the law of the land. Uh, they have to um, fit in with planning regulations and building control and all sorts of things like that when they have to. Um, and there are lots of special cases that aren't covered in this, like treasure trove and so on. But nevertheless, there's a description there of the sort of thing that ownership is in our sort of society. And on the right-hand side of the, of the page, um, I've modified it slightly um, to describe this thing that I refer to as stewardship, um, but, uh, but husbandry is another way, another way of uh, regarding it. Um, 
Only the bits on, in bold on the right are different. So many of the aspects are, are actually very similar to ownership, um, particularly the right to decide what to do with, with the, uh, the land that, that you have. Um, in environmental terms, perhaps the key thing is, is that there's an additional responsibility enshrined in law to make the land ho landholder liable for any damage that they do to their own land or to anybody else's land. And John T. in his, in his book describes um, something that I've never come across before, which is the idea in agricultural leases uh, of a husbandry clause that describes proper ways of relating to the earth. Um, and one of your suggestions in, in, that, in, in that book um, is that all land should have husbandry clauses legally enforceable uh, attached to them to ensure that people don't have the right to mistreat their own land and, uh, and other land. And that would be a key aspect of, of, of stewardship. The other thing that, that in economic and social terms is the other thing that John, John T. Men, men, mentioned, is a duty to pay an annual stewardship fee equal to the market rent of the land, not of the buildings, but of the land, um, into a fund to be used for the benefit of everybody. Um, and that's the other key aspect of, of stewardship. The third thing in, on the right-hand side that's different um, is a consequence of paying the market rent to, uh, to, to, into this fund for the benefit of everybody. Um, and that is that the, the, the value to a landholder of a piece of land, um, the, the rental value net of stewardship fees would be zero because the stewardship fees would equal the market rent of land. Um, and therefore, because uh, it, uh, there was no, not, no money to be made by renting land, uh, its buying and selling price would also be zero. So I implementing this fully um, would introduce a situation in which the market, rent of, uh, the, the market rent of land net of stewardship fees meant, uh, was, was zero, and therefore buying and selling land uh, it would have a, a zero price. If you wanted to use land, though, you'd still have to pay the rent, or whatever, that, whatever that, that, might, that might, might be. But buying and selling um, would actually be a thing of the thing of the past. What you'd be paying for would be a, a, for a use value, not for a, a value that, that you then retained in perpetuity um, for as long as, uh, as your family survived um, uh, and, and, and so on. So that, that is, a, is a very, very brief description of the key features of um, a stewardship economy and I think also the key features uh, of, of the sort of husbandry concept that, that, that John T is um, uh, advocating. Maybe I should, maybe, it looks if I might, might not get away with that. Um, so, um, what I'd like to do is, is, before we get into sort of questions and answers and so on, I'd like you to rearrange yourself around, uh, around tables. And this might be the time to break up the groups who've cosily come in together and, and uh, know each other and uh, have been talking about these sorts of things around the kitchen table before. So get up, walk around, reassemble around, around, around the tables. Um, and then, we'll, then the, 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 the next bit will be to, to think, can you imagine what a stewardship economy might be like? And what are the potential problems or questions uh, that you'd want uh, um, to, uh, to ask and have answered um, if you were to take your thinking of this any, any further? Because I guess that what, what the place uh, that I, I hope that we'll en end up in is of some of you feeling that maybe there's an alternative property system um, that would be better than the sort of options that we've got at the moment. <laughs>